This is a class I've done several times in the diocese, and it's I pretty much do the same class every single time. Um, so when I'm, I like to say that because when I'm giving examples, um, now I can see who's on here, and, and I know your parishes. Um, I'm not making any veiled reference to any conflict I know that's going on there or anything like that. I'm just using examples and giving kind of a broad brushstroke. Um, I think everyone on our list is Episcopalian and a church person, but I come from an Episcopal perspective, priest. Um, I come from a distinctly Christian perspective. We're going to talk a lot about church conflict, although this a lot of these um, a lot of these points can be translated to family, to work, um, to all sorts of different places, to PTO or Masons or your community organizations or whatever you belong to. But I'll trust you to kind of make those translations and those leaps in your head as we go. Um, questions about the format before we roll along? And if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Um, let's do a little bit, um, actually we don't really need to do introductions, do we? What do you think about, usually I start with introductions, it's kind of weird on a webinar, isn't it? It might be nice to just have everyone, you know, everyone can type in where they're, where they're uh, from if they'd like to. Yeah, why don't you type in in the chat, that way we can see if the chat's working all right. Um, why don't you chat, type into the chat, um, where you worship? Deb from Cheryl, hi. Good job finding the chat button. Oh, Richard Larrabee in New Jersey. Hi. Karen from Ithaca. Karen, we've met before, hi. Shelly from, <laughs> from Liverpool, we've definitely met. Hi, Shelly. And Elaine from Owego and John Crossway in the many places in the Diocese of Central New York. He's a very broad reach. Um, it's really good to see you all here today. The first thing I'd like to do, we're also going to use our chat function for this. Um, so get your fingers ready. When you see the word conflict, as you see on your screen right now, this is a word association. What words come to mind? Just Word association, first thought, what words come to mind when you hear the word conflict? Anger. Yeah. What else? What, what do you think of when you hear the word conflict? Frustration, discomfort, difficult, challenging. Yep. Hi, Eleanor from WeGo. Scary. Yeah, so this is pretty common when we brainstorm words that go with conflict. Anger, frustration, discomfort, difficult, challenging, scary, upsetting. So what I want to do is start off our time today by saying this is what most people think about conflict is that it's really hard and it's really kind of scary. And you guys have just um, committed yourselves to spending two hours of a beautiful morning talking about something that can be kind of unpleasant. So give yourselves a round of applause. You're already doing a great thing for today. Um, so thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Um, the next part I want to talk about are my assumptions about conflict. I've written them down so that they're pretty clear. You can find this in a handout that Meredith sent you a link to, and it's also going to come up on these slides. But I'm going to read them through for you. Um, one, because even though there are some people who hate it when people read to them, there are some people who really appreciate it, and I'm going to give them a few minutes right now. And also because it's important that you all know where I'm coming from as I'm presenting. You guys can share my conflict assumptions if you'd like. You can change them. You can make your own. You could disagree with them um, after the class. And, you can, uh, and you, can, you can do whatever you want with this list. But I want you to know where I'm coming from in terms, of, um, in terms of conflict. I think we just got a new person, too. 
Oh, it's Sarah. Hello. So here's my um, conflict assumptions. One, conflict is not inherently good or bad. It is kind of neutral. When two or three together gathered, sometimes conflict just happens. Conflict is normal, healthy, and natural. It's what we do in conflict that can make it good or bad. But conflict itself is just kind of neutral. Number two, conflict can be a sign of vitality and growth. Conflict energizes and creates interest. So um, a lot of the examples I use are from uh, my previous parish, St. Matthew's, because um, I think just Shelley is there from St. Matthew's and I've had enough distance that it's not anything that I'm really caught up in. So when I first got to St. Matthew's, one of the first big conflicts we had to deal with was that we didn't have enough space for our Sunday school classes. There are too many kids in the Sunday school for the space we had and too many Sunday school classes, which was a great problem to have. And we kept reminding ourselves that was a great problem to have. It was important that we worked through the conflict well, but that, the fact that we were struggling with space, the fact that we were having some conflict about where our values were and where we were gonna put people, that was a sign of vitality and growth. Had we just stayed the same, we wouldn't have had that conflict. So conflict doesn't always mean something bad. Number three, we often have a primal response to conflict at first, fight, flight, or freeze. We need to deal with our own stuff, our own assumptions, our own preferences, our own history, before we can deal with conflict effectively. Um, in my experience, I believe that when we find ourselves caught in a conflict, when we feel ourselves caught like this, our body tells us something. Either we get, a, uh, our stomach does a flip, we get a knot in our stomach, we um, might feel like a tightness in our chest or our heart beating faster or a little a lump in our throat. Sometimes there's a little um, tingling behind the eyes and, and some of the frustration kind of leaks out in the form of water. Some people get a headache, but often we, our bodies give us a sense that we're hooked into conflict. And that is our body's invitation to us to go inside and figure out what's going on. Often when we feel this pull, this tug, this burp, we think, okay, fight, flight, or freeze. But what this is, I believe, is an invitation to go internally and figure out what is going on. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Number four, fear is often at the root of conflict and functions as a barrier to break through in order to manage conflict well. When we feel ourselves caught and our body invites us to go inward and we're checking, our, checking in, checking ourselves, one question we can ask ourselves is, okay, what is it that I'm fearing? And sometimes it takes a minute to get honest with ourselves. What is it that I'm, I'm fearing right now? And we have to be a little savvy when we're dealing with somebody else. If we find ourselves in a conflict with another person, um, it's, not, it's not often helpful to say something like, so I see that you're angry. What is it that you really fear? Um, sometimes you really just have to kind of engage in some, some conversation and, and just know that fear is often at the root of that. Um, five. The way we handle conflict in the church directly relates to how we understand and live into the gospel. So do we believe that every person is created by God as a beloved child of God, worthy of love and belonging? Or do we believe that some people are more loved by God than others? Clearly right and wrong answer I'm going for here. Um, do we believe that um, God is a God of abundance? Do we believe that God's grace is bigger than our faults? How do we live into the gospel? And what we believe will influence how we respond to conflict, both within ourselves and how we use our skills and communicate with others. Six, the process of moving through conflict is as important and sometimes even more important than the outcome. So at St. Matthew's, when we had this conflict about um, the kid, where the kids were gonna have Sunday school, 
for a while, we had them in the corner of the parish hall. So there was about, I don't know, 30 or 40 eight o'clockers all getting coffee, checking in with one, each, one another, caring for one another, building relationships. And then in the corner, there was, I don't know, maybe 10 kids, two teachers trying to have a Sunday school lesson, which that's a lot of the kingdom of God right there. But there was also, um, it was a very loud space and it made the grown-ups shush each other a lot, which is just never a nice scene and just never good, especially in church. Um, so the, the, they shush each other. And it was important that we moved through this conflict well. Um, I almost saw this as a test case for us as a parish um, with me as the new priest. It was important that we moved through it well, that we didn't make bad assumptions about the other people, um, that we didn't go, that we didn't get into choosing sides. Um, and we'll I'll talk more about that conflict later, but how we moved through that, um, treating one another with dignity and respect, um, making sure that our relationships were strengthened and not fractured as we moved through that conflict was way more important than where the kids ended up having Sunday school. Um, Maya Angelou has a quote that I used to tape on my desk when I was a young preacher and now I just know it, but if she said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And so how we move through conflict is often more important than the actual outcome, the actual negotiated outcome. Seven, the ultimate goal of moving through conflict is transformation, not just resolution. Resolution is great, but um, transformation is the gold standard. And that's how we, um, transformation happens when we allow enough space for um, the grace and love of the Holy Spirit to work in our relationships and in our conversations. Um, oh, number eight, in conflict, sometimes otherwise normal people will do quite unpredictable things. You all are thinking about stories right now, aren't you? Are you thinking about stories about people who you thought like had a good head on their shoulder and then all of a sudden they find themselves in the conflict and they are spinning out? That happens with people who, um, also people who are grieving and also people who are overtired, especially toddlers. Nine, how we deal with conflict is determined by how we see the world. Do we see the world as a place of fairness and justice? Do we see the world as a place of scarcity where everyone has to compete and fight for what's theirs? Do we see the world as ordered by God? and infused with grace, or do we see the world as kind of a random happenstance of activities? What we believe will, will determine how we respond in conflict. 10, we have deeply ingrained ideas about conflict that we learn from our cultures and our families. So here's an example. My family, um, we spent a lot of time hanging out with my dad's family, and his family is Irish. Now, if you ask them, they will say 100% Irish, but don't do the math on that one. <laughs> My grandmother was a Rosenstein. Um, so they're Irish, and everything they think and feel is like right out there. Just everything right out there on a very large table with a lot of people and a lot, everything just right out there. My husband's family is Norwegian and English. And they are all very firmly committed to keeping any unpleasant feelings really bottled deep inside. And if anyone expresses anything even remotely like a conflict, it was because it was so big that they couldn't choke it down anymore. Now, neither one of those approaches is right and wrong, but it is important to know that what that we just that my husband and I had really different experiences when we came together and made a family we all had different understandings of what was okay and normal and what was not um, so those were things we had to negotiate they were rooted very deep in us from our families and from our cultures um, another example of that is that my husband and I when we fight when we have conflicts or disagreements we don't swear uh, now during the normal course of the day that's a different story but when we're in a conflict we feel ourselves kind of caught we don't swear it's just an unwritten rule that we've come up with and 
that works for us. Now, I have a couple who are friends of mine. They're both ordained Episcopal priests. One of them leads workshops on centering prayer, and the other one is a doc, is, teaches doctoral students in pastoral theology. And when they fight, it is yell, 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 F-bomb, swear word, blah, blah, blah. And they're fine with that. That's just how they do it. Um, they used to joke about the neighbors in their apartment building. <laughs> But that's how they felt engaged. That's how they felt passion. That's how they engaged. And I don't really want to be a part of that. That's not for me, but that is for them. And that's fine. That's what they learned in their cultures. Um, so we all have different ways of approaching conflict. That go very deep. 11. It is the redeeming love of God that makes reconciliation possible we can bring our best selves to the table. We can do our inner work. We can um, have the greatest tools in our tool belt to deal with conflict. But it is through the movement of the Holy Spirit that true reconciliation is possible. I think we, can, we have to bring our best selves to the table, but there's only so much we can do. We always have to leave room for the Holy Spirit as well. 12, the worst thing that can happen in conflict is sin. Conflict itself is just kind of neutral, but when we're in conflict, that is a place where sin can happen. When we treat, when we deny um, each other's dignity, when we deny the goodness in one another, uh, when we hurt another person and child of God, um, that's the worst thing that can happen in conflict. Uh, violence, certainly. Um, and 13, the best thing that can happen in conflict is transformation, reconciliation, forgiveness, redemption, and bringing glory to God. And that's possible in conflict. Questions, are there any questions about my conflict assumptions? Like I said, you can share them, you can disagree with them, you, you don't have to have them, but I want you to know where I'm coming from as we go through the, the course. Um, here, you get to type a little bit again. Um, so get your, get your chat ready. Um, actually, let's go back to the last screen, Merida. Thanks. What are some common issues in parish conflict? What do you think some common issues are? Not that you, you all have conflict in your parishes, but have you heard of other parishes that happen to have conflict? Anyone? What issues do you think? How the budget's used, power struggles. Yep, yep. Some other common issues in um, parish conflict are the mission and identity of a parish. What are our resources and how we can best use them? Conflict from change. Um, sometimes the change is within the congregation, and sometimes the conflict is from outside. Yes, Deb, responsibilities, use of space, good. Who's in charge? Um, and one answer can be solved by looking at the canons and looking at um, our bylaws and our rules and what's written. That's one way of looking at who's in charge, but really we know there's another way of looking at who's in charge. My letter of agreement in my last parish says, as rector, I was in charge of space use, but guess what? I was not in charge of where we kept the silverware in the kitchen. Not at all. It was someone else. So there's formal and informal power. Um, there's communication or um, conflict issues about what we believe, how we worship, role expectations. Conflict happens when expectations are unvoiced, unmet, and unagreed upon. So a lot of times we have these assumptions about roles that we're working with that are unvoiced, and then they're often unmet because they're unvoiced. 
Um, in my in my last conflict at St. Math or at my last parish in St. Matthew's, um, try as I would with the with the number of people we had, um, I was only able to get to see our shut-ins unless they had something really acute going on, maybe four times a year, summer, spring, fall, and winter. And I felt horrible about that. Um, I, w I was not meeting my own expectations. I thought I should see them once a month. I could not figure how, how to get that in the schedule. Couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, they were fine with that. Um, the ones who needed more visits got lay people. We had lay people visit them. I used to call one lady and say, oh, hey, Marion, would you like a visit? Oh, no, Carrie, I don't want you driving in the snow. Why don't you wait a few more months? Or, oh, it's raining. Why don't you wait a few more months? So they were having their needs met. I was feeling bad. And I was seeing them like four times. Um, I have a friend who worked in a parish that was about half the size of St. Matthew's, maybe smaller. She got to see her shut-ins probably every other week, and they complained about it all the time. She got dinged for it all the time. These two communities had really different expectations, and we, no one knows those until they're voiced. So role expectations need to be voiced in order to be met and agreed upon. Um, leadership style can be a, a common conflict in church conflict, uh, micromanagers or laissez-faire. Um, limited resources is a huge issue in parish conflict. Um, there's never enough time, there's never enough money, there's never enough attention. Sometimes there's not enough space, sometimes there's too much space. Um, so limited resources are a source of conflict. And another type of church conflict is misconduct. Um, I'm not going to talk anymore about misconduct because um, that's a whole other set of skills to deal with that. Um, misconduct is really important and really bad. And it's actually so important for us to focus on that I'm taking it out of this basic conflict resolution skills. And that's a whole other course in and of itself. So just because I'm not talking about clergy misconduct doesn't believe that I don't doesn't mean I don't think it's a problem. It's just because I think it's such an important issue. It really deserves its own set of time. Those are common issues in parish conflict. There's also things like the choir. I've found has, the music program is quite often a source of conflict. I don't know why that is, but it sometimes is. Um, paint color seems to be a source of conflict in churches and also carpeting see if we were all here together we might all be laughing together but carpeting is sometimes a big issue i worked in one church where um they had carpeting and the priest wanted to take it out for acoustics and um one of the one of the ladies came up to him and she said you know father if you touch the carpet this will be your iraq war so carpeting. <laughs> All right, questions about um, common issues in parish conflict. This mute is wild. Everyone just seems so quiet. I feel like I'm totally bombing. <laughs> I've got to get used to this format. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Speed lees levels of conflict. Speed lees is a um, conflict consultant in the church. He was one of the gurus at the Alban Institute for a long time. He's written a lot of um, primers on church conflict. And he has come up with this paradigm, um, this, this graphic to explain levels of conflict. And I want to spend a minute talking about this. But first I want to say, um, you see there at the bottom, it says zero in the word depression next to it. When we use that term depression, we're not talking about clinical depression. We're not talking about the mental health diagnosis, which is a real thing um, and, and worthy of our attention in a whole different 
than you. When this is depression, it means like depression like a dip. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because sometimes we see that word and it sends us off in a, in a different direction. I just want to keep us here. So level one is a problem to solve. That's a level one conflict. You may have had level one conflict already today, even if you're the only person in your house, even if you haven't gone anywhere. Level one conflict is just a problem to solve. Um, let's say that Meredith and I want to go out to lunch. And I say, all right, Meredith, that sounds like fun. Where do you want to go? And she said, I want to go to the retreat. I said, mm, I want to go to Panera. When we were at level one, that was just a problem to solve. Where do we go to lunch? Level two is a disagreement. That's where we ended up when she said, I want to go to the retreat. And I said, I want to go to Panera. It's a, just a disagreement. Now, do you guys think we can get through this? Yep. Do you think we can still have a, a, a good relationship? Yup. Do you think that we can get through this without sinning? Yes, we can. A level one conflict is no big deal. I had one about two seconds before this started. My daughter was like, the dog doesn't feel good, her back hurts. What do we do? Level one conflict, problem to solve. I said, you need to bring her upstairs and keep her on the couch. And she said, I don't know, I think I want her to stay with you. That was a disagreement, that was a level two conflict. You know what, we're still okay. She went upstairs. Level three conflict is um, a contest. That's where people are getting a little bit more entrenched in their positions and we start thinking about winning and losing. When we were at disagreement, what I could say to Meredith is, instead of saying, ah, I really want Panera, she go, well, I want the retreat. Well, I want Panera. Well, I want the retreat. Then we're kind of at a contest. But if I go down to disagreement again, and I say, all right, Meredith, tell me what it is about the retreat that you really want and like. And she'd say, well, two things. I really want good soup, and I've just been to Panera like three times, and I'm sick of it. Okay, there's her reasons. And she can say to me, Carrie, why do you want to go to Panera? And I said, well, I want something kind of fast. I've got a meeting after lunch, and I really don't want to be worried about like the waitress and the bill and all of this. I want to just get our food and focus on our conversation and not worry about getting out of there on time. So then, once we talk about why we want what we want, instead of saying, Panera, retreat, Panera, retreat, we can say, okay, how do we find somewhere that where Meredith can have good soup that she's not sick of, and Carrie cannot feel rushed for time? So there's where, that's how we can keep that conflict from escalating. That's how we can keep the conversation going. All right, level three, contest. You've seen this in churches before, I'm sure. And I'm hoping that all of you are doing work in your head to come up with your own examples of these as I'm talking. A contest is where it seems like there's winners and losers. This could be um, either the Sunday school wins or the coffee hour wins. Either we fund the adult education program or we fund the choir. This is a contest where there seems to be winners and losers. Um, at this point, people are trying to get other people on their side. Oh, come on. Don't you think we should really just keep coffee hour? I mean, the kids can really learn. Um, people are trying to get one another on the sides. It's starting to be very uncomfortable for someone in the middle to stay neutral because people keep trying to get them on their side. Level four is fight or flight. Um, this is a, a vestry and a, and a 
priest, maybe, um, in a conflict. This is two different factions in a parish. One's going to win, one's going to lose, and the loser is going to leave. There's no, the, the conflict has gotten so intense that there's no way for someone to lose and stay and still save face. Starting at level three and going into level four, each side is getting entrenched so that they can only hear and receive the things that um, accord with what they already know. They can't really process any information that would help them see the other person's point of view. They're only digging in deeper. Perhaps some of you are thinking about national conflicts at this point, where people are really making broad generalizations about the other side, where it seems like there's gonna be a winner and a loser. Um, that's, that's a bad conflict, that's tough. And then five is intractable situation. This is where there's fight or flight, but not only will the loser leave, the other party is going to destroy them. So not only is that priest going to be forced to resign, but the vestry or the leadership is going to make sure that they never work in the church again. This is where um, one group leaves the church and everyone starts a smear campaign against them. This is where there's restraining orders. This is where there is judges' rulings. This is bad. So what happened in the beginning of our time together when we said, tell me words that you think of when you think about conflict, I think when we think about conflict, we think about these level three, four, and five conflicts. Um, when really we can do, there's level one and two conflicts too that are a lot easier to deal with. Normally, people call the diocese in for help when they're at probably a level three, usually about a level four is when they call us. Um, they certainly will be in touch with us around level five. Where we can be most helpful is right around a level um, three. That's where we can offer the most help. You should definitely call us anyway if you're at a four or five, but there's a lot less things we can do to pull that back down. Um, it's like going to see the doctor. You know, when you go to see the doctor, point the arrow down toward one or two. So when you go to see the doctor, when it's just like one or two, the doctor has a whole lot of interventions they can do. But if you're already up four or five, can't breathe, sometimes there's only so many interventions that they have. So if you can come contact the diocese, please, around a three, that would be super. Zero is depression. And this is something that was added kind of recently to this conflict pyramid. And this is to explain what happens in a congregation or in a relationship when there is absolutely no energy present, even enough to have a conflict. This is like, I don't care. This is lethargy, this is apathy, this is um, not even being able to feel enough anything to get it going. There's no tension, there's no, there's no, almost no life there. Um, and and that, that ends up being a problem to solve too. Um, sometimes when churches have kind of a level four or five conflict and they find themselves on the other side of it, sometimes they'll go through that period of depression just to um, regroup. I think also to kind of revel in the fact that they're not fighting anymore. <laughs> but if we stay at zero for too long, nothing changes and nothing grows. There has to be some kind of tension for things to grow. Um, so that's what depression is. It's fine to be there, but it's also not a state to stay in. It's not our gold standard. As we move up the conflict pyramid there, our levels of intervention get more and more structured. So if I'm at a level one, I'm just talking to the other person. It's a conversation. Maybe we're even texting. Maybe we're even on the phone. It's a problem to solve. I'm probably not even thinking that much about my language. Level two conflict, a disagreement. Maybe we felt that pull a little bit. We can feel something inside of us engaging. 
a disagreement, um, I'm starting to structure a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking more about what I'm saying. I'm maybe practicing some sentences in my head to see how they sound. I'm doing some inner work. I'm checking what's me, what's the other person. Um, three, as we get higher, the structure of the intervention gets more and more strict. When there's a contest, if I go into a parish to help with a level three conflict, I'm not just going to have a parish meeting where I'm like, all right, everyone talk. Mm -mm. That's down level one or two. If I'm at level three, it's okay. Now you have a turn to talk. Thank you. Now you have a turn to talk. Thank you. Um, fight or flight. We start making some rules around, around how we communicate. Um, nope. This person talks now. Please don't do that. Um, and then intractable solutions. This is quite often where communication only happens through lawyers or in a court of law. See how we went, we, stru we the structure um, engaged a lot more. The structure got really a lot stricter as we went from a level one conflict to a level five. Um, that is, oh, Meredith, look at you with that. That's a beautiful arrow, good job. Um, yeah, as the conflict gets higher in number, our approach um, gets more and more structured. Questions about levels of conflict. Sarah, Sarah said there has to be tension for there to be growth. I'm not sure that's an exact quote, but this is so true. It's close enough. <laughs> All right, any questions about levels of conflict? I'm hoping that you all are doing some work in your own heads about problems that you've witnessed or heard about or seen or been in that you can kind of say, oh, this was a one, a two, a three, a four. We can make these slides available to you after if you ask. Um, I can share them and Meredith could share them if that's helpful for you. Um, also the handouts. All right, let's go to our next slide, please. Oh, yeah. oh, hang on, we've got a question. Is contest something you see when there are silos in a group or parish? Is this similar to competition? Sarah, this is a very good segue to my next slide. Also, contest, um, when we're just talking about a level of conflict, Contest is where you start to see sides. So, um, so when you start to see sides forming, then you know that that's a conflict, when it seems like there might be a winner and a loser. Um, and we're, we're gonna talk about compete in a second. And Kathleen, I think Kathleen is office, is that right? Someone says office. Do you find that sometimes technology, texting, can add to misunderstanding and can therefore increase the conflict? Yes. And I'm gonna talk about that later when we talk about um, interpersonal communication and nonverbal communication. Sometimes texting can help a, com a conversation, can help with understanding, and sometimes it can't. We just have to be very aware of its limits. Good questions, thanks. And yes, the office is Kathleen. All right, now let's talk about some functional conflict styles. You can see here, that we have um, a little graph because there is no way we can get downright nerdy in our conflict talk without a little graph here. You can see we start in the corner um, and concern for relationship on that bottom level. Concern for relationship grows. The arrow goes that way. Good arrow, Meredith. That is so cool. And then you can see concern for the issue raising on the vertical axis. We can talk about these a little bit. If I have low concern for the, the relationship and I have low concern for the issue, I may choose to withdraw or ignore. So let's say, okay, so my son plays soccer. He's in high school and we go to watch his games um, on the bleachers. Um, They're playing a game and the ref makes a call. There was a 
the penalty. And he says, okay, this is an indirect kick. And I think, well, that should have been a direct kick. And the guy next to me, who is a dad from the other team, says, no, it's an indirect kick. I honestly don't care about that relationship. I mean, he's a beloved child of God. I want to treat him with dignity. Um, he's worthy of love and belonging, but he's not my person. Um, and my concern for the issue, the concern for whether or not the ref made a correct call at a penalty at a high school JV soccer game, my concern for the issue is way low. Don't really know this guy at all. Don't really care that much about soccer rules. I'm going to withdraw and ignore. He's, I say indirect kick. He says direct kick or vice versa. I don't care. I'm going to be like, okay, I'm going to ignore it. It was a conflict and I chose to ignore it, which is an appropriate response because I have low concern for the relationship and low concern for the issue. Now, let's say that same exchange happens with um, Andy, who is the dad of another soccer player. And he is someone who we share rides with. And so I need to keep things nice with Andy. I still don't care much about the call. I still don't care whether it was really supposed to be a direct or indirect kick. But I do care about my relationship with Andy. So he says, it's supposed to be a direct kick. I say, well, you might be right. I've accommodated. I've let him have his way because I care more about that relationship than I care about the issue. Um, are you guys hearing beeping in the background? Are you? Okay, can you give me a sec? Sorry, the waffles. <laughs> And I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. So that's withdraw and, and accommodate when my concern for the issue is low, like at a soccer game. When my concern for the issue is high, I'm going to make some different conflict choices. Now let's look at compete. We can see the concern for relationship is low, but concern for the issue is high. This is what happens when I call the customer service representative at Express Scripts, who has, uh, and, and that company has messed up my son's inhaler prescription. Um, I'm sure the person on the other line was lovely. Um, she's a beloved child of God, worthy of love and belonging but I don't know her. She's not my person. My concern for the issue, my concern for my son getting his asthma inhaler so that he can breathe, that is a very high issue for me. I have a very high concern for that issue. So I'm going to be a little bit more competitive there. She's going to say, well, da -da. I'm going to say, no, I need, I need the inhaler. I need the inhaler. I need the inhaler. And I'm going to be able Okay, if, now I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to be mean, I am not going to be nasty, I am not going to say anything wrong, but I am going to have way more concern for the issue than I am for the relationship. Um, this is what happens in traffic, when someone's concern for getting into that merge lane is way higher than the concern for whoever it is driving the Porsche Cayenne. This is where we get this. These are not, these are all functional conflict styles. This is not, um, this is not an excuse to misbehave or anything. This, these are all conflict styles that can work. All of us probably have our style that feels the most comfortable to us, but all of these are appropriate at any, at, at any given time, depending on the situation. And I'm hoping that you are all thinking of times when you have used any of these, um, these different styles. Now, if I have kind of a medium concern for the relationship and a medium concern for the issue, that's where we're going to hit compromise. Compromise is sometimes seen as the gold standard of conflict resolution. I would argue that it's not. Compromise is often when, is when someone wins some, you win some and you lose some. 
Um, so a compromise with our lunch thing would have been, uh, well, Meredith, let's go to the retreat this time for you, and we'll go to Panera next time for me. Now, that's fair, but it's not, like, we're both kind of losing something. She's losing some kind of, like, good yummy soup, and I'm losing um, the timing thing. If I cared way more for my relationship with Meredith than I did for where we eat, I would just say, you know what? Let's just, let's just go to retreat. I'm sure it'll be fine. If I super care about getting to my meeting on time and I don't really care as much about my relationship with Meredith, I'm going to say, you know what? It has to be a retreat or it has to be Panera. I just, I'm, I'm going to have to insist. Collaborate is the gold standard when it comes to conflict resolution. Collaborate is when we have a high concern for the issue and a high concern for the relationship, which isn't always true, I get that. But collaborate takes more work and it takes more wisdom and it takes more time, but ultimately it comes up with a better solution. So if I say to Meredith, I'd like to go to Panera because I've got the, I don't want to be worried about time. And Meredith says, I want to go to retreat because I want yummy soup that I'm not sick of. We can say, okay, how can we get Carrie out on time and get Meredith yummy soup that she's not sick of? That is collaboration. And then we can come up with something like, let's go to the Wegmans food court. We don't have to wait for a waitress there and they've got yummy soups that you haven't had. All of these styles work. All of these styles are appropriate. Um, in choosing which style, look at the concern for the issue and the concern for the relationship. Questions or comments about um, functional conflict styles? While I'm waiting, we'll show you the next slide because I put animals for each of these. So the lion is compete. You're gonna to wanna to get what you want. The turtle is withdraw or ignore in the shell. The zebra is compromise. It is not gray. It is black and white and black and white and black and white. Accommodate is the fuzzy teddy bear. And collaborate is the wise old owl because it takes a lot of wisdom and skill to collaborate. Not great metaphors, but a little something silly to help you remember. Questions about functional conflict styles? Examples are very helpful, thank you. Um, and now, since we've talked about functional conflict styles, let's now go to dysfunctional conflict styles. All right, here we go. You guys know that you can move your little boxes around, right? Like Zoom, group chat, you can move that around so you can see different parts of the screen and the videos screens you can move around. All right, a shark. So I know you guys are gonna think of a thought bubble with a person's picture for each of these. Just keep that in your own head. A shark, when they're faced with a conflict, they go in for the kill and they win. I know you know some sharks. The thing with sharks that they're, is that they're often emotionally wounded and they don't want to get hurt again. Sharks want to be heard, which is hard because they're attacking you. Um, so some of these dysfunctional conflict styles have a dichotomy to them. Um, so sharks want to be heard, but they're attacking. So they're fighting the very thing that they're asking for also kind of like toddlers. A skunk. A skunk is, sets off stink bombs to distract from the real or the hard issue. They like conflict engagement. Um, a skunk is a person who starts a fight because they need attention. Um, they need a sense of control and engagement. And a skunk, um, they're often their deep driving need is a need to be loved and valued, which is hard because they stink. You get how that, that forces against each other. This is what makes it a dysfunctional conflict style. 
they're actively fighting against the thing that they need and are asking for. A chameleon, a chameleon is a perfectionist. Um, they keep changing. They're the master of disguise. The conversation keeps switching. Like it's a bait and switch. Wait a minute, I thought we were talking about this and now you're like over here. They're a perfectionist, so they're gonna change the argument. If they don't think they're winning over there, they're gonna start talking about something else. Um, they have um, a big need to be right, chameleons do. Um, they often need help with personal responsibility, which means they often can't see the way that they affect what's going on. They often can't see their blame or their part in the problem um, because they're a perfectionist. They can't bear to see that parts of them are imperfect. And ostrich, um, an ostrich hides and avoids conflict and they may be passive aggressive. Um, this is different than a turtle. A turtle is what you do, um, a turtle is what you do when you really don't care much about the relationship and you really don't care much about the issue. An ostrich quite often cares a lot about both, but they assume that any negative emotion will lead to destruction. They probably haven't had a lot of experience with conflict um, being transformed into something good. Um, they need help talking about the issues and their feelings. Shelly just says, an ostrich will bury its head but kick with its legs, which is passive aggressive. I didn't know the kick part. I just knew that they stuck their butt up in the air, which is why I picked an ostrich. So it's not that people are necessarily always sharks, always skunks, always chameleons, always ostriches. Um, if I'm being absolutely honest, I can think of times when I've been any number of these. Um, these are dysfunctional conflict styles. If we haven't done our work, if we're not in a good place, we can come into a conflict and be one of these guys. And that's not, not helpful. Um, and hopefully you all can think about times when you've, set, when you've been a skunk or a shark or an ostrich or a chameleon. Um, it's not like, hey, once a shark, always a shark. It's just, um, it's sometimes what we get sucked into and um, we need to know that some of these conflict styles are helpful and some of them are not. Question about dysfunctional conflict styles. Type a yes if you guys are thinking of, a, of specific instances and people when we talk about conflict styles. Mm hmm we have a yes. Oh, indeed. We can keep those little thought bubbles to ourselves, but it's nice to, um, to be making connections. Deb says every day. Absolutely. All right. And it's important to be able to learn from conflicts we've been in, conflicts that went well and conflicts that didn't. We can learn from um, both of those. The only way not to be thinking about them would be to ignoring the presentation, LOL. Ha <laughs> um, I'm going to switch gears for a second here, and we're going to go to our next slide, which is called Maps. I'm going to need a little audience participation. This is going to be easy, so get your typing fingers ready. You guys have been doing a very good job with your chat feature. Um, the next exercise I'm going to do, I know, is absolutely ridiculous. I'm going to ask you to do a ridiculous thing so that I can prove my point. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to play along here. Now, I am thinking in my head of a dog. You guys all know what dogs are, right? Okay. Um, I'm thinking of a dog, and I've got the image very clearly in my head. Since you guys know what dogs are, I want, you to, I want you to type in some words that describe the picture in my head. I know this is ridiculous, but play along. It helps me make a point. Describe this dog to me. What, what's this dog like? Nope, the dog is not big. The dog is not big. Four legs and a tail wagging. Well, I'm not sure about the tail, but yeah, legs, friendly. Uh-huh, uh-huh, but I've got a picture. What does this picture look like? What's this picture look like? What color is my dog? How big is it? What's, what kind is it? 
No, can you not see it? I've got it in my head so clearly. Huh. Carrie, we lost you for a second. We don't have your audio. Meredith? There you are. Okay. All right. <laughs> it was something about that dog. <laughs> harder. <laughs> so the, the exercise is ridiculous because I can have a, a dog very clearly in my head. And if you can't see what I'm seeing, you do not know what dog is in my head, even though we all know dogs, right? You can't, you can't guess. So the exercise is funny because there's no way we can do it. There's no way you can just read my mind and know exactly what kind of picture of dog I have in my mind. And it's ridiculous because it's a dog. But what's not ridiculous is that sometimes we do this with other words in the church, like, I like traditional church music. That can go a lot of different directions. To me, it means the 1982 hymnal. To my husband, it means old Baptist hymns. To some people, it means palestrina. To some people, it means like folk mass guitar. So what we talk about when we, when we think about our assumptions and how we view things is our map. So my map of traditional church music includes a really kind of big picture of the 1982 Book of Common Prayer and maybe a couple pockets of other things. Shelly is a, is a church musician. She, she's a musician. Her map of church music is going to be way more detailed and intricate and nuanced than mine. We both know church music. We both have a clear idea, we both have a clear map, but they're different. They overlap sometimes, but they're different. Um, sometimes we can do this if I say things like, I just really like good liturgy. For some people that will mean 1979 prayer book, right, too. And for some people it will mean like incorporating some Celtic resources and something from the New Zealand prayer book. For some people, it will have nothing to do with words at all. It will be all contemplative. Um, for some people, um, good worship will be working in a soup kitchen. What we say when we say good worship means really different things to really different people because we all have our different maps. And I've got a couple of examples about that. I worked at our at St. Paul's in Syracuse for a while when I was younger and I, uh, I was there when it was the cathedral and we had at one point these 20 somethings coming to church. There were a couple, they were really strongly committed Christians, smart, faithful, great folks, active in the church. And they came to church with their Starbucks cups. Now, for some of the people in the parish, their map of what worship looks like has no room for a Starbucks cup on it. And there were some people for whom their map of what's appropriate definitely includes coffee. I mean, there's a coffee cup holder at, in my Wegmans shopping cart. There's, you know, cup holders in the car. I bring my coffee to work. Why wouldn't I bring my coffee to church? So for some people, their map of church includes coffee, and for some people, it didn't. And so there was kind of a conflict there. There was some assumptions we had to break down. We had to really kind of drill down into those. In another parish, uh, at St. Matthew's, we had um, the choir that faced the congregation. They weren't in a choir loft way back there unseen. They weren't just sitting sideways while the congregation sat forward. The, co the congregation and the choir literally looked at each other. And there was this young woman 
who um, was super smart. I think she was a chemistry professor. She would sit in the choir and knit the whole time. And one day someone came up to me and she was like, mm, so Mother Carrie, what are we thinking about the knitting? And that was her way, I think, of saying, listen, knitting does not fit into my map. And I'm wondering if knitting fits into your worship map and I'd like to see what that looks like. Because it doesn't fit into mine and I want to figure out if there's another way I can go besides judging this. I said, well, you know, it's not part of my experience with church. I've never been a part of a church where someone knits in the front. So it's different for me, but I, I don't have a visceral reaction. She's praying, she's making prayer shawls, so I can't see anything wrong with it. I think she's so smart that she needs something to occupy her busy mind while her spirit um, kind of settles into the depths of her soul and makes it easier for her to pray. But that was some map work. This is not part of my church map. What's your church map look like? Do they overlap at all? Um, so maps are the way we see things. And we, they're often unvoiced. We often don't know that we have a map of something or what's on our map until something violates it. Um, and so it's important to be really clear about what our underlying assumptions are. Are there um, questions about maps? We're gonna talk about, we're gonna kind of weave this in a little bit um, as we go along. Making maps as a clarification is useful. Yep. And sometimes we can just kind of be honest about like, oh, I've never seen that before. But just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it's bad or good. I just have to figure out how this fits in. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. We're going to talk about um, the different kind of messages we receive and send. Report, um, a report is concrete information that can be verified or disproved through investigation or comparison with the territory it describes. This is data. Jim is walking with a staggering gait. Jane is smiling. Those are reports. Inference is going beyond factual information to make a statement about the unknown based on what's known. So instead of Jim is walking with a staggering gait, we get Jim has been drinking. The staggering gait, I know, because I can see and observe it. The drinking, I don't know, but I've made a guess based on things that I've seen. Jane is smiling, that's the report. That's the um, kind of objective data. Jane is happy is the inference I made based on what I observed. We make inferences all the time. They're not bad. It's just really important to know in our head what the difference between a report and inference is. A judgment is expressing personal approval or disapproval of a person or a situation. So report, Jim is walking, walking with a staggering gait. Inference, Jim has been drinking. Judgment, Jim is a hopeless drunk. Report, Jane is smiling. Inference, Jane is happy. Judgment, Jane is such a Pollyanna. Having an accurate picture of the world depends on being able to evaluate how factual our beliefs are and how factual the message coming into us are. Um, it's important to be able to distinguish inferences and judgments from facts. It's important to be able to evaluate how correct our inferences and judgments are by testing them against the concrete facts on which they're based. And it's important to recognize that once a judgment is made, thinking stops. Judgment is not always bad. For someone to say, that is racist, or that is racism. That's a judgment, and that's okay to make. 
but yeah, but we need to know that once we make a judgment, our thinking beyond that often stops. So let's do um, let's do a little exercise here, and you can type in your responses if you want. I'm going to give you a couple of sentences, and I want you to say if they are report, inference, or judgment. There's a couple that can go either way, but just pick your best one. That was the worst sermon I ever heard. Judgment. Yeah. The organist played two Bach hymns. Report. Yep, that's a report. The organist doesn't seem to care about traditional church music. Inference, inference. Um, the vestry voted not to give me a raise. It's a report, that's right. The vestry doesn't like me. It's inference. Inference. The vestry is a bunch of idiots. Judgment. Judgment. Yep. Right one feels more Christian than right two. What do we think about that one? Right one feels more Christian than right two. That can be either an inference or a judgment, depending on, um, on how someone's using the word Christian. For us as Christians, that's um, a, a very loaded and, and caring term. Um, for someone who's not of our faith, it may be a little bit more objective. No, but but it's, it's not a report. It's, um, well except for someone's feeling, but it's, that's kind of loaded there. And eight, the church budget has a year end surplus of a hundred thousand dollars. Report. It's actually fiction. <laughs> Fantasy. <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with making inferences and judgments. It's just really important that we know where where we are if we're making an inference or we're making a judgment and if we make a judgment um usually our thinking stops so it's hard to stay open-minded once we've made a judgment sometimes we have to all right um questions about inferences um judgments and reports anything to clarify before we move on No allowance is made for informed opinion. Um, no, it's probably one of those inferences and judgments that can be okay. Yeah, informed opinions. I think it's important to know um, what's observable and what we're kind of guessing at. That's that's really the takeaway from that part. All right. Okay, this next a question also from Dub, just above Karen's question, reporting where. Oh, where is the budget surplus? That was fake. That was on my sheet of paper. That was in fantasy land. That was the Church of Hogwarts that has a $100,000 surplus. <laughs> All right, are we ready to move on to our next slide? This next part I think is one of my favorite parts. All right. Um, the rising strong process. Um, I'm talking about the work here of Brene Brown, who some of you may have heard. Uh, Brene Brown is, um, let, me see, let me see if her name is on the slide. No, it's not, but I'll write it here. Hang on, let me, let me send this to everyone so you can see who I'm talking about. Brene Brown. Um, look her up after the class. 
and she's wonderful. She is a trained social worker. She went in the direction of doing research. So she does a lot of research um, based on people's stories about vulnerability and shame. She has done two TED Talks that are very popular. And if you just type in Brene Brown TED Talk into your, um, into your search engine later after the class, you'll see um, two of her um, TED Talks, which are maybe about 18, 20 minutes each. They give you a really good sense of her, her work, especially her early work. One of her recent books is called Rising Strong. Her most recent book is called Braving the Wilderness, which is also wonderful, but I'm gonna talk about Rising Strong. She noticed that there are a lot of stories in our culture about people falling down or failing and getting back up and succeeding. And that's a big narrative that we love. Fell down, bad things happened, we got up, things were better. What she wanted to do was slow down that moment in the middle after someone fell and before they were all the way up and rolling again. How do we rise up from our failures? So that's what this research and this book was about. She calls this the rising strong process. And the goal of the rising strong process is to rise from our falls, to overcome our mistakes, and to face hurt in a way that brings more wisdom and wholeheartedness into our our lives. She's gotten this, um, this concept of wholehearted living as is really the standard for the fullness of life um, from one of our prayers in the uh, Episcopal Book of Common Prayer, because Brene Brown is an Episcopalian, which is a fact not to be missed. We celebrate it. Um, and so the Rising Strong process acknowledges that we will fall, and this is how we rise from those falls. We will make mistakes, and here's some ways that we can overcome those mistakes. And we will get hurt, and these are some ways we can face hurt in, an, in a way that brings wisdom and wholeheartedness into our lives. And she breaks it down into three different steps, the reckoning, the rumble, and the revolution. The reckoning is a curiosity. So when we feel ourselves caught, when we feel that, um, that body signal, the, the flip in the stomach, the tightness in the chest, the heart racing, the tightness in the, the lump in the throat, the tingling in the eyes, the, whatever your kind of body signal is that something's going on here, um, that you're kind of caught in something, the invitation is to go inside and to get curious about what's going on in you. And she calls that walking into our story. So instead of judging ourselves, oh man, I wish I wasn't reacting like this, or oh, this person is being horrible right now, to go in and to really check out what's going on in our own stories, walking into our own stories. Um, and, if, and if there's... Um, and she uses this line. You can see it on the sidebar here. The story I'm making up in my head. And if you come away with nothing else from our time together this morning, remember this sentence because it can save the day. The story I'm making up in my head. So when we get caught and we feel that body response to conflict, fight, flight, or freeze, that knot, that tension, that lump, that heat, that tingle, that sting, that's an invitation to go deeper, get curious, walk into our stories. And the sentence that can help us get honest with that is the story I'm making up in my head. So when, um, when I came home last night and the recycle bins were still on the sidewalk, the story I made up in my head is that you think that I, am, I, I was gonna just be able to carry them, that I didn't have stuff in my hands. Um, when I saw that, when I came downstairs and the dishes weren't done, the story I made up in my head is that you don't care if our house is clean. Um, when you, 
um, when the priest didn't pass the peace with me, the story I made up in my head is that the priest doesn't like me. What's helpful about this sentence is that it allows us to get honest with ourselves about what's going on. What becomes very brave and very vulnerable is when we can share that story with another person. When you didn't call on me during the class, the story I made up in my head is that you don't think that what I have to offer is valuable. It takes vulnerability and courage to say that out loud because it gives the person the chance to either agree or disagree with you, which is gonna give you some data. They're either gonna say, yes, Carrie, I, I, um, the, the class had already heard what you had to say about five times, and so um, you adding it again wasn't gonna be valuable. They can maybe tell me a hard truth, or maybe they can say, oh my gosh, that wasn't what I meant at all, and then we can kind of fix that. The story I'm making up in my head. Um, is a great sentence. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I want to get to the part that says honesty, owning our own stories and challenging confabulations. Confabulations are what we do because human beings are hardwired for story. We like a beginning, a middle, and an end. In fact, um, I think studies have proven that we actually get some kind of biochemical reward, some neurochemical reward for a complete story in our head, beginning, middle, and end. Um, and actually our brains don't even care if the story's true. So sometimes we hear a beginning and a middle to a story and we make up the end because our brain needs that completion. So we, at, we confabulate, we put that information in after. Um, I can, I knew I was confabulating, um, once when I was a freshman in college and I was hanging out with this really, um, cool group of kids and there was this cool dreamy boy named Preston and he was tall and he had long hair and he was very quiet and, um, we hung out and he was so quiet that I didn't really know much about him, but don't worry, I filled in the gaps myself. <laughs> That was a confabulation. Um, the parts of his personality I didn't know, I just made up in my head. He's very caring, he's very sensitive, he must love poetry and puppies. Um, so there, it was a lie, I just made it up in my head because I didn't have a whole story. Um, we, we confabulate and I'm not sure we can ever stop. What we can do is get honest about our confabulations and challenge them. What actually happened and how did I fill in the gap? What is the story I'm making up in my head? What are the gaps I'm filling in in my head? The bravery comes, one, when we can get honest with ourselves about what's going on, what the story we're making up is, what, um, what our confabulations are. And then the next level of bravery that leads to transformation is being able to share that with another person. The so the story I'm making up in my head is this, and you can put it out there. It's not blaming the other person. It's owning that we are making up a story, but it allows the person to agree or disagree or add some information into that so people are all on the same page. Um, so the story I'm making up in my head, I would encourage you to, um, to, be, to think about that and work on that in your own head to start out with. When you feel yourself kind of caught, try the story I'm making up in my head is, because this takes practice. Um, I would encourage you to use this technique in really low stress, in low um, energy environments first, um, where there's not a whole lot at stake, where you can feel pretty easy about it. So the waiter comes and says, oh, I'm sorry, the food's gonna take a, a while longer than I thought. I can say, all right, well, the story I was making up in my head is that um, it's really busy back there in the kitchen. You can say yes or no. It's a super low impact scenario, but it allows us practice. 
Um, so getting it right in our head and making that a pattern and a habit for ourselves to check in in that way. And then also um, practicing being brave and vulnerable and strong and being able to put that out. All right, that was a lot. What kind of questions do you have about the rising strong process? Any questions? Okay. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. Oh, wait a minute, Shelly. To finish the process takes both practice and courage. Yeah, it does. And I know that this is a big ask. I know that this is a big ask. It may not seem that hard when we're sitting in our warm houses as the snow falls outside all by ourselves, but it is, um, but this is brave. This is brave. Do I have, the next question is, do I have any tips for receiving someone else's story when they're sharing it bravely? Um, this, um, the tips I would have is if someone shares their story, to let it sit in the middle of you two. It's something that came from the other person as a gift that was shared in vulnerability and courage. So it's important to receive it as a gift. And it's important to let it hang out between the two of you so you can then choose what you're going to take in. So if I, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, so when you, when you didn't say hi to me at the beginning of the service, the story I was making up in my head is that you didn't care about me. I'm gonna put that in the middle of us because it's gonna tell me something about that person and it may tell me something about me, it may not. And it, and I, and I don't, I don't have to take the whole thing, uh, but I do need to listen to it and honor it. Um, Deb wrote, "Be a listener." Um, Kathleen said, "The story I'm making up in my head is a significant piece to understand. Once I make up my own story, it's sometimes hard to hear and see the real story." I think that's a great point. Remember when we got to to um, report inference and judgment. And once we make up a judgment, it's hard to think past that. Um, that's, that's one of the things that can go on once we kind of settle on the story in our own head. I had a, a conversation with a colleague once that I had planned some events. Um, and I said to the other people um, who were kind of peripherally involved, it's like, oh, hey, if you guys want to stop by and like, you know, just meet the group and maybe say some things that you're doing around here, something about your ministry, feel free. But like, if it doesn't fit into your schedule, don't worry about it. And what I meant for that to be was um, a very gracious invitation that people could either accept or not. I was intending that to give them choices and to not be really directive about where they had to be and when. I was intending that to be a very generous offer. But I had a colleague who was very brave and courageous and said to me, didn't quite use the line, the story I'm making up in my head, but said, you know, when you said we can either stop by or not, the story I'm making up in my head is that my ministry isn't all that valued, that you can kind of either take it or leave it. Um, and I would rather have a time where we can all show up and have that be set, um, set up intentionally. And I was so grateful that she was able to share that with me because I could say, oh my gosh, I, I really, I meant something so, I thought I was going to, I thought I was offering something really nice and generous and invitational. And it came across as um, probably snotty and I didn't mean that at all, but I wouldn't have been able to, um, to correct that or to, to put my say into that if she only had kept that in her head. The fact that she was brave enough to say that out loud helped us to get some kind of understanding together. And I, I certainly learned something for the next time I planned an event. 
um, and we were able to share some understanding. So that moment itself was hard. Like she was being vulnerable and saying some truths and I was receiving something that was hard. Um, but it was hard, but it was good. And I'm really glad. I'm so grateful that she said that out loud. Otherwise, we may not have moved through that. It's just an example of how um, showing up and rising strong and being brave can lead to transformation in a lot of different ways. Um, so try the story I'm making up in my head. Try it in your own head. Try it out loud in low impact situations. Um, and just play with it. And as you play with it in your own head, it'll become more natural to you. It'll, and you'll figure out how to kind of say that in your own way. And uh, it, it's, a help, it's a help in getting honest with ourselves and with each other. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Interpersonal communication. Um, now there is a bunch of studies about um, verbal and nonverbal communication. I just kind of picked one, um, but they all kind of say the same thing. When we receive a message, in general, only about 7% of what we hear and understand comes from people's words. About 33% comes from their tone of voice and about 60% comes from their body language. Which is super interesting because when we send messages, we are much more, um, we probably spend about 60% of our energy on the words, and, um, and then maybe 40% maybe if we're lucky on the tone and the body language. We spend most of our energy focused on our words, and yet that's only 7% of what people hear. Remember that Maya Angelou quote, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Um, tone, you know that tone is really important. Um, this is, I think, what we get to when, we, um, when people, acknowledge the limits of email and text messaging because we don't get that tone. Um, you know, to say like, oh my gosh, it's, and to say it's beautiful outside is one thing. And to say, it's beautiful outside. I mean, it, you, you, you know, you all know, you all know, you all can think of times when tone has totally changed what the words mean. Body language is important. Um, and body language is complex. So, you know, I remember, he I'm gonna switch this a little bit. I remember hearing that like, if someone sits like this, they're closed off. But I don't experience it like that at all. Sometimes people sit like this when they're comfy, when they wanna like self comfort a little bit, if they're cold. Um, if I wanted to be closed off, I could do that without crossing my arms. Um, so body language is complex. It's not as easy as just, you know, if you have an open stance, you're open. Timing is part of um, nonverbal communication. So if Meredith sent me a text at 2 p.m. and said, hey, do you have a minute to talk? I'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. Wonder what's up. Maybe Max did, maybe her son did something really funny and cute. Um, but if she texts me at 2 a.m. and says, hey, do you have time to talk? Doesn't that change the meaning, the timing of that? If someone came up to me right before service started and says, um, I have a prayer request, that feels really different than someone telling me um, a while after the service or during coffee hour. It seems to imply some kind of urgency. Um, posture, we've kind of talked about. Um, with body language. Proximity, um, how close you are to someone, communicates something. If you say like, if you call across the room and say, hey, hey Richard, how you doing? Well, that's not gonna invite a very in-depth response. That's just gonna be like, fine, care. If I really wanna know how he's doing, I'm gonna come a little closer so that we can have a conversation without other people hearing. Um, and also eye contact is a big part of body language. 
and nonverbal communication, which is really funny to be able to say on um, a video conference, because on a video conference, everyone fails at eye contact all the time. Because if I'm actually looking at the pictures of you on my screen, like I am right now, it looks like I'm not looking at you, right? But I am. Now, but if I, now this looks like I'm looking at you, I think, but I'm actually looking at the camera and not at you at all. So eye contact and video conferencing is always a big fail, just to put that out there. But when you're in person, you need to know with eye contact, more is not always better. So please don't hear eye contact and say, you know, Mother Carrie just said eye contact is really important, so I'm just going to do a whole lot. This gets freaky. The takeaway from this is people are only holding themselves accountable um, for their words, but it's their tone and body language that says a lot. They're probably not thinking about their tone and body language at all. When you're giving a message, they're only listening to your words a little bit. They're really listening to your tone and body language. And again, if we can, I wonder if I can do this. If we can remember Speed Lee's level of conflict, um, as you go up, I know it's it backwards, isn't it? <laughs> as you go up the conflict um, pyramid here, you're going to want to pay, you're going to want to pay way more attention as you go up to your words, your tone, and your body language. Because as, sense, as the conflict rises, sensitivity rises, and people are going to be really parsing apart the words, the tone, and the body language. The higher the level of conflict, the more intentional um, we should get about those things. All right. Um, oh, I was going to talk about emojis and text messaging. So I, my theory is that, um, so yes, yes, Karen, a concern. There's no body language in texts or emails. Right. But there is some nonverbal communication. The timing um, is a way of communicating something. Uh, when people communicate, when people type in all cap letters, that sounds like yelling. So there is some nonverbal communication in written word. Um, exclamation points kind of um, keep things a little like looser and happier. Um, an ellipsis makes it seem like I'm still open to this. I'm just kind of wondering. Um, but I think this is why emojis are so popular right now. Because emojis give us a way to, um, to say like, you know, hey, I'm sorry I messed up yesterday, smiley face, or hey, everything's, you know, you can, you can put something as like, oh, I'm laughing at myself, or um, I'm smiling when I say this, or something like that. So I think, I think that's why emojis are so helpful, because we know that nonverbal communication is limited when we're talking just in, um, in text, whether that's an email or a text message, um, or on Facebook or something. I think that's why we've been augmenting that, com that um, communication a bit too. Um, but as the conflict escalates, it's gonna, I think it's important to have more of a structured conversation. So if you're at, if you're at a level three conflict, um, actually, you know, even if you're at a level two, text messaging is probably not gonna work very well. Thank you. Yeah, text, yeah, I, I mean, texts, emails, fine for level one. Once you get up above that, um, usually a phone call, because you can do tone, at least in a phone call, um, or face-to-face -face is helpful, because text messaging is great, um, and emails are great, but they have their limitations, too. One of the lines I've said um, is, I think we've re reached the limits of um, text messaging at this point, or I think we've reached the limits of, of emails communication right now. Um, and that's a way to say, like, if we continue this conversation, we should really, really do it face to face. All right, let's go back. To, let's go to I statements, please. Yes. 
Um, I, I'm imagining that most of you have heard of I statements and reflective listening. I statements, um, especially when, when things are a little tense, um, to be able to own our own feelings and to not blame someone is really important. Because when we blame someone, well, you, you did this and you did this and you did this, it kind of backs them in a corner and people who feel like they're in a corner um, aren't always able to access their very good conflict resolution skills. Um, so I statements are when we can own our own feelings. Like when this happened, and then we, we use an observable behavior there, a report. When, um, you know, when you started the meeting without me, I felt left out. Um, please, please wait 20 minutes next time. Um, or, you know, when, when you did this, and, it, and that shouldn't be some kind of judgment or inference. Like, when you ignored me or when you disrespected me, well, that's an inference. Like, you, that when you needs to be a report. Um, and then the I feel should be a real feeling. I feel hurt. I felt frustrated. I felt ignored. Um, I felt sh ashamed. Um, if you say like after I feel, it's usually not a feeling. Um, like when you started that meeting without me, I felt like I didn't really matter, or I felt like punching a hole through the wall. These are all fake, by the way, examples. But um, like isn't a feeling. Make sure you put a feeling in there. And if you have a hard time accessing your feelings and you want to get going with an I statement, I felt hurt or I felt frustrated are usually two ones you can go to until you can really deep dig down and get to your real feelings. And if you need to, you can do one more step. Um, please um, let me know next time, or please do this, or I would like it if you blah. Um, you can always add something else to that. Um, but owning our own feelings um, helps to make sure, helps um, pe people can't really disagree with that because it's your feeling. And people can't really disagree with a report because it's data, it's observable behavior. Um, it's not a judgment or an inference. Um, I have a, a message from Thane here. One nice trick I try to remember is to check in to try to see how I'm being received in a conversation or an interaction. Usually people give me lots of clues about how my efforts to communicate are being received through their body language, etc. That kind of feedback back can be hard to receive though when it doesn't sync up with how I intend the communication. Right, but it will give you a chance to like check in. I think that's why I'm feeling so bizarre about this um, presentation is I can't really see, <laughs> can't really see people's faces and know how to check in. <laughs> feels, um, feels like I'm doing this in, an, in very much in isolation. Um, that's not a, a critique, I think it's just a, a limitation of the medium. Um, but yeah, you can, you can see in people's body language how they're responding sometimes. Although, after years and years of preaching to an eight o'clock congregation, I'm gonna tell you what, those beloved people of God, whom I love very much, would sit there like this. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm bombing. I'm so sorry, Jesus, I have lost your people. But, and then afterward, they would come up to me and say, oh my gosh, Mother Carrie, that was a really good sermon. It really touched me then, and it really moved me, or I thought it was funny. But the whole time, I was looking at their faces like this. Um, so people don't, don't pay a lot of attention to their own body language. They had no idea that they were looking comatose out there. They had no idea. They probably weren't even thinking that I could see them at that point. So sometimes body language, um, will give you something you can use and sometimes you might need to check it out. <laughs> it's the eight o'clock shuffle. <laughs> um, reflective listening. This is a way to be able to listen to another person and make sure we get it right. When you reflective listen, you're focusing on the other person. You're not going in your head to find your next point not defending ourselves, not trying to, you know, build a case up against or for something. We're just focusing on what the other person is saying. 
And then to let them know that we've heard or to check in to see if we've heard right, we paraphrase. So if Meredith said to me like, oh, yesterday was horrible. I had a flat tire and the water heater broke and then I burned the dinner. I could say, oh, yesterday sounded horrible. It sounds like your tire got flat and your water heater broke and you burned your dinner. Well, that's just parroting back. Like that's just, that's not helpful. Um, that's just an instant replay. But if I can say like, oh gosh, it sounds like you had several rough things going on. It helps her feel heard. Um, and I paraphrase to help me understand better. It also gives her a chance to be able to correct me if I'm wrong. She could say, well, these three things happened yesterday. And I'd say, oh, that's stunk. She said, no, I actually felt really grateful because I had enough money to fix my car and um, my husband knows how to fix the water heater. And, you know, there was a lot of dinner that wasn't burned. So I actually felt really grateful. So she could correct my assumptions if I'm reflective listening. Um, resist when we're listening, especially reflective listening, resist the interpretation, uh, res resist the impulse to give interpretation, judgment, or problem solving. So it really sounds like um, you should have checked the, the gas under the burner. You know, you should really cook that low and slow. That's not reflective listening that's giving advice. Um, and often if someone has a, a high emotional level, advice is something that's not always welcome. Um, and if you're not sure and you have some really good advice to give, you can check it out with them. But it's not reflective listening anymore. Just say, actually, I have a piece of advice. Are you open? to that? Or would you like to hear something? Um, reflective listening is very helpful in high tension situations because often if a person is not heard, if they don't feel heard, they will repeat themselves over and over again. Um, so they can say, well, it's just that I feel like that priest doesn't like, or I feel like I have a really big problem with that supply priest. The supply priest is really a problem here, really a problem. Not that supply priests are ever a problem, I'm just making this up. Um, and I could say, well, gosh, things sound, things sound a little tough. No, like seriously, the supply priest is a real problem. It's a real problem, like there's a big problem. Okay, so it sounds like you really have an issue with the supply priest. Yes. And until people feel heard, especially when they're emotionally charged, they're gonna just keep going with the same thing. So reflective listening can serve to calm the emotional energy and be able to move forward a bit. Richard, Richard Larrabee talked to, um, about paraphrase versus interpretation. Uh, I think interpretation can be, um, it goes one step beyond. Paraphrasing is really to get at what the person is saying. Interpretation is adding our own spin on it. Well, it sounds like um, you really have some work to do around personal accountability. Oh, sheesh, I don't know, just listen to me. You know, so I think that um, interpretation adds a layer of your own, you're, you're adding a layer of your own bias, your own assumptions um, on top of that. So I think paraphrase is a little more neutral than interpretation. Not that interpretation is always bad, but it's not reflective listening. So it's just important to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Good question. Other, oh, sometimes interpretation, if we can say something that someone can't say for themselves can be helpful. It can be. Um, yeah, I think you just have to be real, real sure about that. It sounds like, um, you might have a specific situation in mind. All right, getting to yes. Yes, we can flip. Um, this is something I'm just gonna point to right now because this is in the handouts that we sent you. I have a, a, a handout here that is a summary of getting to yes. I know you can't read it and that it's probably backwards. Oh, that doesn't work. But it looks like this. Getting to Yes is a great book. It was written ages ago. It's been a staple in um, organizational development and business for a long time. The subtitle is Negotiation, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In, which makes it sound really tough. It's not, it's a very personable approach. Um, and also they define negotiation very broadly. 
This is not the kind of negotiation that's like, let's buy a car. I, I'll give you $50. No, I want 100. Let's do 75. I mean, it's not that kind of negotiation. It's about conflict resolution. This book is, is so popular that I have found a copy of it at almost every garage sale I've been to. <laughs> and so whenever I find it, I always pick it up and um, give it away. So Getting to Yes, a great book. Um, I think the marketing on it is a little off, but it must be working. Everyone buys it. Four main tenets of Getting to Yes is, first of all, to separate the people from the problem. Oh, Meredith, that's really helpful that you're writing that down. Thank you. Um, both the substance of the conflict and the relationship are really important. Um, it's important to remember that the person you're dealing with in conflict is a beloved child of God. We try to understand the other person's point of view and their maps. We try to put themselves in their shoes. We, tr we don't deduce intention, their intentions from our fears. I'm going to say that again. We don't deduce their intentions from our fears. We don't blame them for our problem. And we make sure that our proposals are consistent with their values and maps. Um, we recognize our emotions and their own and theirs. Um, we acknowledge all of that is legitimate. We allow some letting off of steam and um, we don't react out of emotion, or we at least try to keep that in check. We use good communication skills like active listening, speaking to be understood, using reports and being careful about inferences and judgments, and speaking about ourselves using I statements. So those are some parts of separating the people from the problem. This is all in the handout, so you don't have to um, write too furiously if, if you're worried about that. The second point is um, focus on interests rather than positions. Interests define the problems. So in our St. Matthew's conflict, the position would have been coffee hour in the parish hall or Sunday school in the parish hall. One or the other, winners or losers, right? If we focus, we didn't do that. We focused on our interests instead and said, okay, how do we educate our children in the knowledge and love of God and have the time and space for maintaining and building relationships? Both of those things are important. If we had just stuck to positions and said, kids in the parish hall, adults in the parish hall, there's like no winning there. You could do some kind of silly compromise with like, well, one week you'll do this and one week blah, 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 blah. everyone's losing something that way. But if we can focus on issues, which are often shared, who's not going to agree with wanting kids to um, grow in their knowledge and love of the Lord? Yes, Jesus loves me. And who's going to disagree with the adults um, building and forming and deepening community and relationship? So we, we kept this at the issue rather than the position so that we had somewhere to go. Um, behind, op behind opposed positions lie shared and compatible interests as well as conflicting ones. So we ask, identif the, identifying the issues, we ask clarifying questions. Like why would we do this or why not? Like how, what would this get for you? How would this move things along for you? Um, what would that do for you? How would that work? Instead of judging things, we ask clarifying questions to make sure we understand. We realize that each side has multiple interests. We acknowledge the most powerful interests are basic human needs. Um, so if there's ever a need um, for a food, clothing, and shelter, or love and belonging, those are all very basic human needs. Um, acknowledge interests as part of the problem looking forward, not backward, when we're looking to get to an agreement. Um, be concrete, but flexible. Concrete means clear, but flexible means there can be, there's some room there. Um, and be hard on the problem, but soft on the people. Hard on the problem, soft on the people. Um, 
the third point in this book, the third kind of section, the th third component is invent op options for mutual gain. Um, when serving as a third party in a dispute, if so, if you're helping two other people or two other groups negotiate, um, it's best for the people in the conflict to come up with their own solutions. Um, and then the pitfalls to avoid are premature judgment. Um, try to suspend your inner critic for a little bit of time. We talked a little bit about like when we find ourselves at a judgment, it's hard to keep thinking past that. Um, searching for a single answer, we try to avoid that. Um, we don't stop brainstorming ideas until they run out. Um, we want to we want to challenge the assumption of a fixed pie that the options are limited. So when we talk about negotiations um, and inventing options for mutual gain, we talk about expanding the pie. The pie isn't just here. There's more options. Um, so expanding the pie is saying, okay, well, the only it's not that there's only two restaurants here. It's not that there's only Panera and the retreat. Let's expand the pie. What other options are available for us? So that's what we did when we said, let's do Wegmans. We expanded the pie. Um, Separate inventing options from deciding. That's when we can brainstorm without judgment. Um, we, we, and we look for mutual gain. We identify the share interest, shared interests and we dovetail um, differing interests. So that's when we went from how, the how to. How to go somewhere for lunch that both has yummy soup that Meredith's not sick of and that will get carried out on time. How do we provide for our children and their knowledge and love of God, and also provide space and time for the adults to connect and build relationships? So those are the how-to statements. We get, can get to issues that are mutually agreed upon. And then the fourth part of this book is insist on using objective criteria. Use fair standards, fair procedures. Um, be reasonable. And and open to reason and don't yield to pressure. Sometimes fair and equal are two different things. Uh, so that's a, that's a really super quick summary of, of the book, Getting to Yes. What I hope it is, is um, I hope it's kind of an advertisement for you to go out to your next garage sale and get the book. They also have it on amazon.com. Um, because it, it really is good. And if you find yourselves in a situation where you're, you're the third party, um, helping other people work things out, or you're, um, or you're in a conflict with someone else and you really want to be intentional about how you go through it, or there's something going on in your parish that you really want to work through, having this book at home is great. Um, it's not rich, written from a Christian point of view. So any place in the summary where I've said something about beloved child of God, I put that in there. This is definitely a business book, but I really trust that you can make the leap to a Christian community from this. Questions about getting to yes. You all are gonna run out to garage sales right now, huh? All right, we're coming to the end of our time together. And I wanted to let you know that one of the handouts that was sent to you is a conflict resolution suggested reading list. So if you are very interested in really nerding out and you want some books to help you with that, Getting to Yes is on the list. Moving Your Church Through Conflict by Speed Lease is on the list. It's a very small book, very good. Um, there's also a book called Fierce Conversations, Achieving Success at Work in Life, One Conversation at a Time by Susan Scott. It's a very good book. Um, Rising Strong, the Brene Brown book is on there that I talked about. And also a book by Ronald W. Richardson, Creating a Healthier Church, Family Systems Theory, Leadership, and Congregational Life uh, is very, it's very good. Um, it, it goes through a lot of systems theory, but it helps, especially with that part in the process where you go inside and check yourself. Where's my motives? Where am I coming from? Where am I getting caught here? If you want help with that part of the process, um, the Creating a Healthier Church is a really accessible and really good book for that. Um, 
both for congregations in general, but also for people who are in parishes who just want to go a little bit deeper into this. So I am at the end of the presentation. You guys have been wonderful. It is 12 o'clock. So if you um, have a very strict schedule today, feel free to sign off. Thanks for being here. If anyone would like to stay and chat, um, I'm here, snowed in with a computer and internet, so have at. <laughs> <laughs>